April 2nd, 1966, a six-pound baby girl is born. A parent worth fear realize. Their joy is muted by the discovery that there is something wrong with this baby. In fact, there are many things wrong with this baby. First is her cry, that first cry. It's soft, it's weak, and then it goes silent for 10 minutes. No air. They bring her back. She will surely have brain damage. Then it's her arms, they're short, so short, they look more like flippers than arms. Her hands, frozen joints, hitchhiker thumbs. How will she hold a toothbrush, a hairbrush, take care of herself with those hands? Her legs, they're bent, contracted. Her feet are curled in. They call that club feet. She'll never walk on those feet. She has a hole in her mouth, cleft palate. She will struggle to find her voice in spoken word. And then as her ears, they are misshapen, swollen, teeny, tiny ear canals. Cauliflower ears, they call that. She will become one of the hard of hearing. But is she going to live, her parents want to know. A life deemed not worth living, the doctors respond, and I quote, unfortunately, yes. She's going to live. Take her to the institution. She will be too much. This is a life of suffering. People will understand. These parents, there was no discussion. There was no deliberation. This was not on the table. AMA, against medical advice, these parents turned their backs on medicine, and they said no. This child will not live and die in the shadows of an institution, hidden as if a monster, an object of shame and embarrassment. This child will not become another forgotten child in that place where the water runs still. In an act of love and defiance, they took her home. April 25th, 1985, a black baby boy is born to two young parents seeking to find their way as they raise their firstborn son. A system that was stressed by their responsibilities was strained by the worry of raising a black son in a white world. How do we communicate to our son that his very existence will be considered a threat, his parents wondered. How do we tell our son that his humanity will be denied and his capabilities questioned? How do we teach our son to love himself, knowing that he will be despised and feared simply because of the color of his skin? How do we keep our son safe in a world in which he will never be safe? That little girl would grow up in a house with a lot of love and a lot of laughter. But all the love and all the laughter wouldn't protect her from what it would mean to be seen in this body in a world that celebrates symmetry, proportioned bodies, and fluid movements. This world would tell her she was helpless, fragile, weak, deformed, ugly, a mistake. Some would even say a sin. And as those parents sought to raise their black son, they realized that he would be bombarded by messages describing black men as rapist, dangerous, lazy, stupid, athlete, absent, and criminal. And then the questions. Yeah, the questions. What's wrong with you? Do you know your daddy? Did your mom and dad use drugs? How many kids do you have? You aren't considering having children, are you? Do you play basketball? How old are you? You're not as scary as I thought you would be. You don't scare me anymore. Never going to contribute. Never going to have a job. What could you do? Education? Why bother? We better measure your intelligence first. Never going to love. Never going to be loved. Another dependent draining the system. Poverty forever. Athlete 
always, invisible, constantly. Can you see me for more than just a scary black man? You have no idea what it took for me to get here today. You could never walk in my shoes. You couldn't handle it. Neither could you. These are things I would tell myself as I struggled with my privilege, knowing that I would feel guilty for seeing the oppression of others. I was tired fighting my own fight, but then somebody trusted me, took a chance to share their story. Ready or not, I listened. I bet you never were assumed to be in special education classes, followed around in a store because they thought you were stealing, and thought to be a criminal simply because you were a black male. This is true. And I bet you were never followed in a store by people with cameras, snapping your photos so that they go home and show family and friends what they saw in the store today. Approached by random strangers telling you what an inspiration you are, when you know what they're really telling you is that they're relieved. You've shown them it could be so much worse. This is true. So what do we do now? Share our narratives. Worst day, best day? Okay. Worst day. Worst day. So imagine it's 2012 and I'm sitting with hope, expecting to see a display of humanity, but instead another blow with two words, not guilty. Hope is dashed and I'm reminded once again that not every life matters. Hope is replaced with fear, joy with anger, and happiness with sadness. Another black soul gone, another black body deemed to be a threat, and another black male blamed for his own death. Trayvon Martin, I remember that day. You do? I was watching too. A betrayal. No one ever, ever goes to jail, and I am sorry for that. Your worst day. Occupational therapy in a school for the handicap, special school. I'm seven or eight years old, and two white coats go around, and they collect two and three of us at a time from our classes. And they take us to a room behind white curtains and mats on the floor, and they tell us, this is where you will learn to dress and undress yourself independently. You will become a big boy and a big girl here. Only babies get dressed by their mommies and daddies. The white coats pulled out stopwatches, and they told us they would be timing us, because we'd have to beat the clock as well. Every week, we were taunted by their voices, telling us to hurry up, try harder. And there were two ways out of occupational therapy. One was to beat the clock, graduate. Two was to fail so many times that you were deemed a waste of time, no potential. They broke our spirits a little bit each week. But the real tragedy was the day that I beat the clock, I figured it out. And the devils in the white coats, they praised me, they complimented me, they told me what a big girl I was, that I might go to the normal school. And they did that in front of my handicapped classmates, who I left behind the white curtains. They took my community that day, and a piece of my soul, and I never got that back. I didn't know they did those things to children. It seems like so much of your pain has been invisible, and I'm sorry for that. Best day. Best day. So imagine it's 2013, and for the first time in history, the name Dr. Nifley is announced. And so begins a lifetime of service to humanity. You see, my family have been service to humanity for generations through ministry of song, as educators, and as servant leaders in our communities. But there's been a price for that service in the form of racism, discrimination, second-class citizenship. 
but my family was willing to pay that price because they knew one day someone would realize the full potential of their efforts. I am the realization of those efforts. I'm the exclamation mark on my family's narrative as the first doctor in my family. A beautiful day, a day of survival, celebration, liberation. Your best day. July 2017, Disability March in DC. This is a day that 800 disabled members and their allies are called in to celebrate and to engage in civil disobedience. We're here to honor our history, our leaders who fought battles against the imprisonment of our community in institution and shelter workshops. The battle against the ugly laws that punished us for showing our bodies on the streets, chaining themselves to buses, wheelchairs, walkers, bodies, and all, demanding universal access and equity. That day, I was in awe of our imperfect motion, where no one's movements were fluid and no one was symmetrical or proportioned, and we were very atypical in our behaviors. It was a day that we challenged the oppressive paradigms of normalcy, and we were liberated. And 40 plus years later, the devil in the white coats, they don't haunt me anymore. They have no power over me. I'm here, and I am proud, and I am disabled, and no mistake. Thank you for trusting me with your narrative. Me too. How does one stay in the struggle? And find community and collective power. How does one find power in a place of oppression? And then surrender power from positions of privilege. Maybe through advocacy, faith, and humility. Allyship and hope. I'm listening. I'm hearing that. I'm feeling that. And I want to fight for all that and help. I want to fight, but I don't know how. And I'm afraid I'm just going to get it wrong. Oh, you will. And I will call you out. <laughs> and I hope you'll call me in, because I'll call you in. Can you handle that? Yes. What do you need from me? Believe me. Speak up. Stand up. Even when I'm not there. Share my story, and don't try to rewrite it to make yourself feel better. Call others out, don't let them off the hook. And be prepared to be called in. Be honest. Be real. Take responsibility. Take responsibility. Julie and Stephen, everyone.